Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. In the last few years, we as a world have become intimately acquainted with prayer. Yes, some of this is due to Justin Bieber's new song, Pray. But there are other reasons as well. You see, in the last few years, our connectivity to the world has increased. And one of the results is that we have been more immediately present in the face of world tragedy of which there seems to have unfortunately been no shortage in recent years. And if there's one certainty in the face of uncertain tragedy, it is prayer. We have seen over and over again after earthquakes, tsunamis, and other disasters, people <coughs> pray. Sometimes this happens in familiar ways and sometimes not. But there seems to be something nearly universal about the need to pray in times of trial. And as we know, this isn't limited to natural disasters. No, we can rest assured that when leaders are oppressing their people, when parents are struggling to feed their children, when governments can't pass a budget, prayer abounds. The truth is, if there's one thing that our connection to the world has taught us, it is that although it might look differently for different people, nearly all cultures and faiths share a need to connect with God through prayer. But even if we just look at Christians, we know that it looks differently for different people. Each of us pray differently. Some of us pray in formal ways, using the prayers we have learned as children. Our Father, who art in heaven, now I lay me down to sleep, rub a dub dub, thanks for the grub. But there are others of us who reserve prayer only for those times Sometimes it's a bit self-serving, like when we need to pass an exam or not get pulled over by that cop, please God. <laughs> but perhaps more often, like we notice around the world, prayer comes when we are trying to find our way out of a difficult situation. The fact is, when our loved one is struggling, we pray. When we can't find a job, we pray, and when we feel utterly alone, we pray. And the good news is that it works. We might not always get what we expect, but we do connect with God. That's enough. And so today, on this fifth Sunday in Lent, as we continue our commitment to focus on a different spiritual discipline each week, today we turn to one of the biggies, prayer, as we hear a passage that just might help us sort out what all this praying business is about. Pray tell. <laughs> our scripture lesson today is from the Gospel of John and involves the last public act of ministry for Jesus in the entire gospel. It's the story of the raising of Lazarus. Now it's interesting that the first public act of ministry for Jesus in John's gospel happens at a wedding, and the last takes place at a funeral. The highs and the lows, joys and the sorrows. Perhaps the gospel writer wanted his reader to understand that Jesus is present in both the highs and the lows of life. And if that's the case, then perhaps this offers us our first reminder about prayer, which is simply this. We don't have to wait till tragedy to pray. Yes, our prayer life often increases when we are overwhelmed by the circumstances of life, but that doesn't have to be the only time in which we connect with God. The psalmists offer us a really good example. One of the great things about the psalms is that they're all different. Some are happy prayers, and some are sad prayers, and some are just 
plain, angry prayers. But they are all worthwhile because they all connect with God. Friends, like our brothers and sisters around the world, we are really pretty good at trying to connect with God through prayer in the face of tragedy, during those times of anger and sorrow. But we often forget to pray in those moments of laughter or joy. This is perhaps where we might learn something from our Muslim brothers and sisters. They stop five times a day to orient themselves toward God and to give thanks. Friends, what would it mean if we stopped five times during our day, just five, to orient ourselves towards God? It might mean having to establish a relationship that includes the highs as well as the lows. And the truth is, just like in other relationships, it's much easier to connect with someone during tragedy when we already have an established relationship apart from that tragedy. All that being said, however, our story today happens to be one of those more tragic times for prayer. It begins several verses before our passage was so beautifully read, when Lazarus is said to have become ill, and Mary and Martha, his sisters, send away for Jesus to come and help. They send away for Jesus to come and help. And in some ways, this is how prayer often works. When we learn of tragedy, our first instinct is to send away, to send our prayer away to God and hope that this tragedy can be taken away, that God would somehow swoop down and change the circumstances to make our loved ones better, to heal our brokenness, to ease our pain. But as we learn over and over and over again in life, that rarely happens. And although we know theologically that God has given us freedom to live in this world, which means that bad things are going to happen to each of us, we also know that in the midst of life's biggest tragedies, we would sometimes prefer a God who just swoops in and changes them. But it doesn't work that way. As the story goes, Jesus hears about Lazarus and says that this will not lead to death. True and false. And he spends a couple more days where he was before he heads to Bethany. And by the time Jesus finally arrives, we are told that Lazarus has been dead for four days. Now this four days business is significant because there was an understanding in Jewish circles of the day that the spirit of the deceased hung around the body for three days. So Jesus arriving on the fourth day in our story seems to suggest to John's readers a particular kind of death, namely actual death. In our story, Lazarus is portrayed as dead. Really dead, stick a fork in him, he's done. <laughs> <laughs> now it was also the custom of the day for mourners to hang around with the family for at least a week, which is why there's a crowd of people there with Mary and Martha when Jesus arrives. But before Jesus gets to the home, however, we're told that Martha, one of the sisters, comes out to meet him. And the first thing she says is, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Lord, if you had been here, brother would not have died. And although we might not have uttered those exact words, they are certainly familiar. We recognize both Martha's pain <coughs> and her blame. Friends, how often have we prayed in anger to God, where were you? Where are you? Why did you let this happen? The truth is, this is how we feel. We wonder what all this praying is about if tragedy 
tragedy still occurs, if our loved ones still suffer, if our pain still lingers. And in those moments, it's not such a bad thing to express that to God, to get angry and to weep and to curse God, because you know what? God can take it. We want to know why. We should name that. The trouble comes when we stay there. Because after we express our anger and our tears and our doubt, we have a choice. And in our story, one choice is made by each sister. The first choice is to express our anger, to weep our tears, and then to slowly, somehow, with the help of others, find our way back into the world. And the other choice is to just stop there. The good news, as we learn in the story, is that God stays with us in both choices. But the bad news is that true life is only possible with one. Martha finds a way to hope, even if at first it is still just wishful thinking. She says to Jesus, but even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask. To which Jesus responds, your brother will rise again. Martha answers that she knows about the idea of the resurrection on the last day, but Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. I am the resurrection and the life. Do you hear? Over and over again in the Gospel of John, we are reminded about what this whole enterprise is about. John has Jesus here again reminding us that the hope of our faith is life. The question is, what is life? In the Gospel of John, life is connection with God. Death is disconnection. The hope of the Gospel is that even physical fourth day death can't separate us from God. And the good news is, we don't have to wait until death to be connected. It begins now. Eternal life begins now. Friends, if we want to know why we pray, John gives us an answer to connect to God. Why do we pray? Because it connects us to God. Full stop. And that connection brings with it life. Not at death, but right now. Friends, our faith is not about what happens when we die. It's about what happens when we truly and fully live. And when we forget that, we miss the point. To be clear, it's not that we can avoid death. Not even Jesus does that. It means that death is not the final destination. That even though we die, yet shall we live. Our story continues with Martha running to get her sister Mary. By telling her that Jesus has called for her. Not exactly true, but we'll give it to her. <laughs> And when Mary comes, she starts the same way Martha did. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. The difference between Martha and Mary in this story is that Mary stops there. She expresses her anger and cries. where she stops. She doesn't utter another word. We get it. Because though in our hearts we want to be like Martha, 
and be able to work through our anger so that we can profess our faith and hope in God. Sometimes we just need to cry. And that's okay. Friends, prayer isn't about getting what we want. It's about stating how we are before God. We pray to name before God what is on our hearts, the state of our hearts. And if we are angry, we should allow ourselves to be angry. And if we're sad, we should allow ourselves to be sad. But if we feel like laughing, we should also laugh. The truth is, friends, prayer isn't some magical formula that we state and suddenly everything we want will happen. No, prayer is our way of just naming what is on our hearts before God, to connect with God. And even though it might not change the circumstances, it reminds us that we are not alone. And in our story, it's in that moment that Jesus becomes so overwhelmed that he begins to weep. Jesus weeps with Mary. Friends, that's what the gospel is about. Not that Jesus steps in and raises a man from the dead, but that Jesus stops and weeps with us over our loss. Jesus weeps with us. The truth is, the story could end here, and it would be much more helpful for this sermon. <laughs> the idea that Jesus goes and has them roll away the stinky tomb, the stone, and, and tells Lazarus to Jesus, tells Lazarus to get up and come out is a bit problematic for how we think about prayer. That doesn't happen for us. No matter how we cut it, we don't have Jesus physically present with us anymore to help bring our loved ones back from the dead, no matter how much we might want that to happen. But friends, this passage does offer us a reminder that hope comes from expressing our true selves before God, our angry, our hopeful, our sad, our excited selves, and recognizing that God feels those things with us. Friends, the hope of our faith lies in a God who is intimately connected with us. Who doesn't just laugh when we laugh or cry when we cry, but stands with us in those moments when we feel utterly overwhelmed and points us towards life. So, whether we learn to pray from Justin Bieber or just stumble our way through the 